Equa was the mechanism by which uh, my understanding was enabled to expand. Uh, India was the focus and the object and uh, uh, the core of my broader understanding. Chicago was in a turbulent period at that time, and there were stories going on all the time. It was just after the gangster period, the Al Capone period. Uh, they still had uh, shotguns riding with the drivers on some of the news trucks and so on and so forth. So we got a feeling for what it, it, the, the front page of Ben Hecht and so on, and got a sense of <coughs> uh, what newspapering in a big city was like. My editors told me after two years that uh, I was too green and too young to be a foreign correspondent for the Chicago Daily News, which had one of the great foreign services in this country. About the same time, a man came from a little foundation in New York and visited the Daily News and told the editors that his trustees uh, had concluded that their mission uh, to help get Americans to better understand countries of the sort that we now call third world countries uh, ought to include somebody for India. Uh, they had previously sent people uh, to other parts, the Middle East, to uh, Manchuria, uh, to Russia. Uh, now in 1938, they, they thought that things were astir in India. And so he came to Daily News to see if it had any young men uh, that would be interested in this. And he wouldn't take anybody who was married. He wouldn't take anybody who seemed to have a link. Mildred and I, six months earlier, had gotten engaged. But we had agreed because we, I couldn't afford to keep us we would not talk about our engagement to anybody so we could have our normal social life going on, she in Champagne and I in Chicago. It never occurred to me to mention it when I finally had my contact with this man from New York whose name was Walter S. Rogers. We talked about almost everything except India. Hardly mentioned India, certainly didn't mention the fellowship to speak of. And finally, I had uh, a reservation to go back by train that night because I was a working kid. Uh, <clears throat> and I said, um, well, what about this suggestion of India? And he said, well, why don't you write me a letter saying what you'd like to do? And I thought that was a put off. Yeah, but I went back to Chicago and struggled with a letter. Well, what do I want to do about India? I never heard anything about India. Oh, I knew, I, I'd heard missionaries talk. Uh, I knew the names of Gandhi and Nehru. I knew about Maharajas and Tigers, but that was it. Uh, however, uh, I did get to talk with some people and, and tried to develop a letter which said, uh, India, it looks as if it's going to be important, and the British are already in negotiations with the nationalists and so on. And um, then I didn't hear from him. Uh, <clears throat> finally, I asked the managing editor to inquire, and word came back from Rogers saying, well, uh, you wouldn't write that letter if you had known anything about India. But then that's, he offered me the fellowship. And uh, this was in August, September of 1938. Roger's method, as I learned it subsequently, was really to find his own people and, and make choices and then sell his choices to these 
uh, half a dozen people on the board, and that was about all there were that they didn't meet very often, I believe. Uh, and he was uh, confident in his own ability to pick and to judge people. He was a Chicagoan who went to work for the crane company, the plumbing company, uh, and became the, an assistant to the son of the founder, Charles R. Crane, who himself became president of the company in about 1910, before World War II. Uh, Rogers had taken a law degree, a, 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 a belief from night school, on a part-time basis while he was working there. And um, he'd been very much interested in, in journalism. Uh, and he, began, he traveled widely. And Rogers discovered that because Woodrow Wilson's, after he became president, Woodrow Wilson's speeches were reported by the European or Japanese agencies, uh, Hava, uh, Dome, and so on. Uh, the reporting wasn't accurate sometimes, and there were twists, uh, slants uh, on the stories. And so after we got in, after the war became the major preoccupation of uh, Washington, uh, he and Charles R. Crane persuaded President Wilson that the U.S. needed an information service uh, that would uh, deliver the full text of presidential speeches and congressional actions and so on uh, worldwide. They were on the, st on the staff of President Wilson. Uh, they discerned, more than discerned, they, they perceived, uh, that Wilson did very well with Lloyd George and Clemenceau and uh, the others when questions related to Europe or to the Atlantic or what have you. But when it came to the rest of the world, to Africa, to Asia in particular, but also to some extent Latin America, the European chiefs of government had colonial services and other administrators who had had lifelong time in these various areas. And when the question came up, uh, they uh, could pinpoint the issues and Wilson had nobody on his staff who could respond or know what really was the behind the, uh, the, the statement and so on. And they felt after World War II, no, after World War I, uh, that um, what America needed was uh, a group of people who had some osmotic understanding of uh, these various lesser known foreign areas. And uh, this idea rolled around in their minds. And by 1925, uh, they decided that with Charles R. Crane's money and some, uh, some contributions by John Crane, and Rogers as the director, they would set up a foundation uh, to establish an American core of area specialists. In 1926, Walter Rogers wrote his famous letter uh, describing what this core should be. And uh, that has been kicked around a lot since. Uh,